Welcome back to World War II TV, and we start start our first Philippines week here on the channel with a special guest, Ricardo Jose, who is the country's foremost scholar, historian, and author about the war years. Because this is our first stream at this hour for some time, I expect we've got a few new live viewers. If you are new to World War II TV and this is your first live stream, well, firstly, welcome aboard. Secondly, the information you need is in the description below. That's where you'll find information about my guests' books, their websites, if they have one. You'll find out where you can help World War II TV, uh, merchandise, things like that, all in the description below. And keep an eye on the active sidebar. We have a great community of, of followers and viewers here in World War II TV. So if you have questions, some if, if we don't ask them, they may get asked in the sidebar there. But I'm going to bring my guest in now. Good evening where you are, Rico. How are you today? Good evening and uh, good afternoon in your case. And uh, whatever time it is in the world, uh, good day. Thank you. So, so the Philippines, we were just talking before going live there about how on this channel, we've normally come at the Philippines from the U.S. point of view and MacArthur looms large in that. But tell us about what you're doing to educate people about the Philippines and what your day to day job is, is over there and how, how you see World War II from, from your perspective. Well, uh, professionally, I was teaching with the University of the Philippines. I, I was a professor at the Department of History. I have uh, retired actually, but uh, I've been extended as a professor emeritus. And uh, one thing that I do is I teach special courses on uh, American occupation, which include, includes the Japanese occupation. I teach courses on uh, graduate courses on the Japanese occupation. I'm involved in a lot of uh, museums and exhibits and uh, other publicity materials or preparation of publicity materials that instruct the youth in uh, what happened during the war here. And of course, the perspective here is quite different from what the outside world sees it as. As, as you mentioned, if you talk about the Philippines, it's MacArthur, Corregidor, and uh, Leyte, and all of this. But from a Filipino point of view, it's quite different. And of course, it's uh, that we suffered for three years under the Japanese, but that uh, prior to that, the uh, Filipinos fought a, a bitter struggle in the peninsula of Bataan, and there were Filipinos in Corregidor as well. So that thing is something that has not quite been sufficiently addressed, not in the textbooks, not in school, uh, not in classrooms. And I had gotten to know many of the veterans personally. They're all gone by this time. I interviewed several of them. So the personal stories of Filipinos on the front lines was something that is something that inspired me. It's something that I still uh, want to continue working on. I, I hope to write more books on what Filipinos did during the war and uh, carry it over to the next generation. Well, so brilliant. I, I tell my well put. And I was also saying, you know, as myself living in France, you know, I think of the German occupation coming through where I live now, and the difficulties that the French faced, and the and the compromises, and and the and the words mm -hmm. we use like collaboration and resistance, and what is resistance and what is collaboration. I think a lot of the Westerners yes. watching this today, when we think of the Japanese occupation of various countries, we can't relate to the Japanese going through perhaps the mm -hmm. foothills of Burma because the foothills of Burma are so different to France or to to, to the Channel mm -hmm. Islands, but. But yes. the Philippines, a lot of the, a lot of your cities there, they, they are they are. And I'm not using this as an insulting term. They are Westernized. They're modern. They they are they are thriving modern societies. And the Japanese coming in there, in many ways, has echoes of the Germans moving into cities like Paris or or, or to, to to other cities in Europe. And so, I think for me, the Philippines is like the bridge between the ETO and the Pacific Theater because it kind of has elements of the both both. And I think that's where understanding both the events of 1941, 42, and then later 1945, I think will echo uh, for, for many of the viewers and, and draw these parallels. But anyway, we're going down a rabbit hole of talking about the German occupation of, of France. But you've come on with a PowerPoint. We'll bring that up on screen there, but you're in charge. Well, folks, feel, feel free to, to jump in with questions. And we may have some viewers, I say, who don't normally watch this time of day. So feel free to jump in. But I'm going to hand over to my guest, Rico, to take us to um, this, this story. And um, and again, this is part of a whole series of Philippine shows this week, and then we're having another week in October. So, so over to you. Mm -hmm. Okay, so thank you, Paul, and uh, thank you for inviting me to, post, uh, to be part of this show. So let me start with this. Uh, the topic that I would like to talk about this, uh, this uh, afternoon or this evening is about the Filipino defenders, uh, those who fought in the defense of the Philippines from December 1941 to May 1942. 
So that is the defense, that is the period of the defense of the Philippines. And uh, this particular poster that we see here, the fighting Filipinos, was supposed to try to bring to the American people the concept or the idea that Filipinos were fighting for freedom even at this particular point in time when this poster was issued in 1943, that uh, Filipinos even under the Japanese occupation were still fighting uh, for freedom, that, 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 that we would never give up uh, to unto the Japanese. So uh, in order to understand what happened during the war, as uh, you mentioned earlier, Paul, the Filipino city, cities were very westernized. Uh, we had been under the Americans for 40 years. Uh, we had learned how to speak English. The American educational system had been brought to the Philippines. Of course, prior to that, the Spaniards had been here for almost 400 years, and they introduced Christianity and so forth. So uh, the, as you did mention, many Filipinos considered themselves as between East and West, or actually mm -hmm. being a or of both, that they were the bridge, uh, they were they were the ones who we were the ones who could facilitate communication between east and west. But we were proud of our Western heritage and uh, the Southeast Asian quality of the Philippines was something that we were discovering, at least in the intellectual sense at this point. So, uh, going back to this particular illustration, it again showed that uh, we were fighting for the same ideals that the Americans were fighting for. But before going into this in more detail, what was the Philippines anyway? So if we look at this map, uh, the Philippines is this group of islands over here in the center. So our position was and still is today very strategic, very important. We're right in the center of Southeast Asia in terms of the, the seas. So this is called alternatively the West Philippine Sea or the South Philippine Sea, and you have mainland Southeast Asia here. You have the Pacific Ocean. Uh, Japan is over to the northeast, and China is directly north. So the Philippines is in a central location, and because of this, the Japanese had to take the Philippines in order to take advantage of the rich resources in the southeast part of this this world. What what is interesting about this map is not only does it show the Philippines in its context, showing it in its position in Southeast Asia, but also it has a map of the United States superimposed. So for those of you in the United States, this kind of gives the scale of, uh, it gives a comparative scale insofar as uh, distances were concerned. Now, if you go to the Philippines specifically, now the Philippines is a group of over 7,000 islands. Uh, it's an archipelago. And if you are given the task of defending this archipelago, it becomes a very difficult problem. In fact, some of the Americans during the American period uh, felt that the Philippines was simply indefensible. Too many islands, too many good beaches. Uh, we are proud of our beaches today, and uh, any of our good beaches could become very excellent landing beaches by mm. any enemy that decided to take the Philippines. So. This problem uh, was something that anybody dealing with Philippine security would have to tackle uh, how to defend the Philippines. Well, some of the people, some of the officers in the US Army said it simply could not be defended. And that's why some of them believed that the Philippines should be granted independence so the US would not have the responsibility mm -hmm. of defending it. However, you have at a crucial point in time, in 1935, the Philippines moving forward into what was known as a Commonwealth status, wherein the Philippines would become a fully independent country after 10 years. There would be a transition period, in which case the Philippines would have its own constitution, the Philippines would have its own elected officials, we would have a president. Uh, most of the activities of the Commonwealth government would actually be autonomous from the United States. Anything that dealt with local issues was handled by that government. And the elected president at the time was a fellow called Manuel Quezon, who's still very important insofar as Philippine history is concerned. Now, this is Quezon on the left, and on the right side is General MacArthur. This was taken in the early, uh, just about the time that the Commonwealth period started. So, Quezon was aware of the fact that once the Philippines became independent, there had to be some sort of defense plan. Mm. 
And he looked around. There were no Filipinos who had the ability to plan defense of the Philippines on such a large scale. And so he went to the United States, talked with General MacArthur, who was then chief of staff of the U.S. Army, and invited him to come over here to become the military advisor. And so MacArthur did come over and they devised a plan with some of his associates. And that led to the creation of the Philippine Army of the Commonwealth. And so the two were very close friends at this particular time. And when MacArthur sat down to plan the Philippine army, as it would turn out to be, he employed the services of, among others, Major, Dw Major Dwight Eisenhower, who is on the right side of this picture. So Eisenhower, who becomes more famous in the European war and becomes president of the United States, was actually in the Philippines for almost five years, helping MacArthur prepare the Philippines to defend itself. And what did that defense plan entail? Basically, it meant the Philippines would defend itself at almost any point that the enemy might invade. So the Philippines was divided into 10 military districts. Here you have the rough uh, lines showing the military districts. Uh, these were districts that were based on the population of each particular region. So if you look at the main island of Luzon, which is over here, Luzon was divided into five military districts, partly because Manila was there, the capital of the Philippines, also because Luzon was the most populated island in the whole Philippines. So five military districts. And ideally, each military district would raise one division, a reserve division, that would be able to protect itself. Now, that was the ideal. And they were supposed to have 10 years to do that. If you'll notice, one big problem that we see here is that a very strategic island in the south, Mindanao, was only one military district. That would have only one reserve division guard this huge island plus the islands that were attached to it in, over in the southwest. So uh, this island still, come, uh, it still is mentioned in the news today. There are occasional problems with security. And of course, the fact that the borders are here is something that, that we have to still worry about, worry about today. But the fact that now you are coming up with each region in the Philippines coming out with its own reserve division meant that men had to be trained. And so you had soldiers being trained. Uh, the, scheme was to have a small regular army, just basically one division of uh, infantry soldiers, an artillery unit, uh, there even was a cavalry unit, a small cavalry unit, and uh, this was supposed to provide for the ground defense. And to bolster all of this for each of the districts, uh, each district was to train soldiers who turned 21 years old, and they would be trained, there was a mandatory training system, for four, five and a half months. And after that, they were supposed to be trained soldiers and they would go into the reserves and they could be called at any time. So this was the basic idea. And after 10 years of that training, you would now have about half a million men ready to serve the callers when the, when the, when the call came. You'll notice here that uh, you have the American flag and the Philippine flag. That was a sign that this was the Commonwealth period. The Philippines was not totally independent yep. yet, we are still under the United States. So the two flags had to fly hand in hand with each other. And behind it is the building, this was the administrative building of what was then called Camp Murphy, it's today Camp Aguinaldo, and that building still exists today. The main gate is over to the right side of the picture. But most of these soldiers who are marching here are the trainees, the five and a half month trainees. And after they finished the five, five and a half months, they would go back to their whatever they were doing before training and they would become civilians again, waiting for the call if the call would come. So, Rico, just to, the, the training they received, yes. was that broad, regular mm -hmm. army training as if anyone would get in any country world, or was it tailored to the specific needs of defending the Philippines, you know, mm -hmm. or, or was it a bit, a bit of both? Okay, good question. Uh, basically, the soldiers we saw there were infantry soldiers. So the main thrust of the defense was really infantry. You had to learn how to fire a rifle or machine guns. Uh, second to that would be field artillery. You would have a small field artillery component. This, act, this photograph actually shows uh, 
what we what, mountain guns. This is a mountain gun unit, so it's they are mounted on horses. So there were supposed to be small. There's a small artillery unit, and in addition to this, uh, there was supposed to be a small aerial unit and a small, not a navy. We could never afford a navy. It was called the offshore patrol. Right. So right. you have these different sections, but the bulk of it was the infantryman, the rifle rifleman, the machine gunner. Uh, they would provide security on the ground. They would defend the beaches. And then supporting them would be the artillery behind them. And ideally, if we had enough money and if we had, we had enough time, the offshore patrol would protect the, the, the waters and you would have the air, uh, what was called the Philippine Army Air Corps, which was not yet an air force, to protect the skies. But the main problem there was time and money. It was all very expensive. And uh, we needed land for training grounds, uh, for buying ammunition and uh, equipment and arms. And we could not definitely afford the most modern weapons at that time. We simply had to follow what MacArthur advised the government to do. Uh, this was the most effective weapon at that time, but it was cost effective and so forth. So most of the guns that we see here in this uh, mountain gun unit are actually World War I guns. These were 2.95 inch guns that had been dismantled and which would see a lot of action in World War II. So many of the guns that were actually used were surplus equipment from World War I. And later on, we would try to get some more modern equipment, but again, depending on the availability and the amount of money that was available. So there, was, uh, there were some integ integral uh, trucks, there was the transportation core, but not too many. Again, to save on money and to make it more adapted to Philippine conditions, the number of vehicles that were actually part of the units that would be created were very small. It was felt that instead, the buses, buses, uh, cars, even taxi cabs could be taken by the government if necessary. So there was this whole civilian sector that could be tapped in case of emergency, in case of war. So this was going to be a whole citizen army type of thing everybody would pitch in and again this was nice on in parade this this uh, particular photograph of trucks on parade was mm. nice uh in parades but in actuality this was very small uh, this was a, this was a very small unit uh field artillery was uh, very important uh, these were guns that uh, we bought these are British 75s that were adapted to American use, again, from World War II, uh, World War I use with uh, high-speed adapters so that they could be towed by trucks. So we, had, we could have a motorized uh, regiment, as it were. So the main plan of this was to prevent any invader from landing at the beaches. So, uh, in fact, some of the units would even say that if in... France in World War I, the motto was, they shall not pass. Uh, the motto of these units was, they shall not land. So the main, or the, the main objective of this army was really to prevent anyone from landing. So mm. defense at the beaches. As we'll see, when World War II broke out, it didn't actually turn out that way. Uh, it, was very, it was very optimistic to think that we could actually defend the beaches. Uh, optimism in the 1930s, Rika, whatever next. I mean, the, the world <laughs> is full of optimism in the 1930s. Yeah. The French and the Maginot line springs to mind. Uh -huh. right. <laughs> yes, very true. So, well, again, remember, all of this is happening before the Sino-Japanese War broke out. This is before World War II breaks out in Europe. So the reality of modern war had not yet struck when this plans, these plans were being developed. Now, after the Japanese went to war with China, and after the Nazis began invading Europe, that changed things very dramatically. There was no longer this peacetime effort to uh, plan for uh, a long period of time to plan for the defense. Things were moving very quickly. So larger, larger caliber guns, such as this 155 millimeter gun, these were again World War I. Uh, weapons that had been brought to the Philippines. The U.S. Army kept them in stocks. They allowed the Philippine Army to train with them. And these would have been very effective weapons in the coast defense uh, policy. 
They could be kilometers behind the lines and they could hit Japanese ships or whoever the invaders were from a long distance. So we were training with this. And aside from the ground forces, we did train with a small air corps. Uh, again, uh, this was something that had to start from scratch. We did not have any airplanes to begin with. Uh, our pilots were very, very few. So the pilots had to be trained from the ground up. A few had studied aviation in the United States. And so they came back uh, knowing which planes to buy. And naturally, the first planes that had to be bought were trainers that would train other pilots. But to save money again, the trainers had to have dual or even triple purposes. So this particular group of planes here were trainers, but they also doubled as scout bombers. You'll notice the machine gun in the back here. So these had multiple roles and uh, they could serve as trainers, they could serve as scouts, they could serve as light bombers. So again, this was the basic principle of trying to make things work with the budget, with the money that was available. Uh, one of the new ideas that uh, MacArthur brought in, MacArthur was not a Navy man, of course, so he felt that the cheapest way to defend the Philippine coasts was through torpedo boats. Now, the British had developed these boats in World War I. The Italians had also developed some of them in the interwar years, and Japan, ironically, had also developed the idea of these torpedo boats. So we ordered two from, the, from Great Britain, uh, these are the first two boats that we did order. And by the end of the 10-year transition period, 1946, ideally we would have had 50 of these boats. And that, it felt, was enough to patrol the Philippine coasts, large as they were. But uh, the people, the, the men who were training here were very uh, highly motivated. They were very excited about this. This was extremely modern for them. Uh, they packed a wallop, they had two torpedoes each, they had depth charges, and so for their size and for the cost, they were very cost-efficient machines. So apart from uh, saving costs, uh, saving money in, in this multiple role uh, equipment, the Philippine government and MacArthur himself would try to uh, save money by letting the army use materials that could be made in the Philippines. So if we go back a couple of slides, you'll notice that the soldiers are wearing helmets that are not steel helmets, but they were made out of coconut fiber. So that would help develop the Philippine coconut industry. They were locally produced. So the army could also be seen as an economic, uh, as a source of economic development. The trouble with this is while it was cheap, while it was good against the sun, these coconut fiber helmets don't la didn't last very long. And definitely they would not protect you from a bullet. They would not protect you from shrapnel. So uh, very few of them exist today. They're extremely rare collector's items now. Wow. So, so uh, this was the, so you have the ground forces, you have the very uh, new, the very uh, ambitious air force, and then you have a nautical force as well. And, uh, since the Americans were, it was not sure whether the Americans would actually leave, uh, uh, would stay in the har harbor forts. Uh, there, was, there were several harbor forts that the Americans had developed to protect Manila Bay and to protect other uh, key bays in the Philippines. So Filipinos also trained with the coastal guns that the Americans had. So if the Americans were to leave these coastal batteries, uh, I think someone will talk about Corredor later on in more detail. Yep. So right, Philippines I... were actually training to take over, to take the place. So these are Philippine Military Academy cadets who are training with some of these American guns. So it was supposed to be a total system, total preparedness system. I was just going to jump in there, Rika, yes. because with this, you know, you said there's obviously a budget. Um, they, but they, this this could work really well if it's integrated. If everything is working with some centralized system, yes, I'm thinking right. of the you know defense of Britain in 1940 with radar right. and, and and observers yes. and the Royal Navy and the Royal Air Force. If this is if they're all working to a single uh, idea, so that the, the, the patrol boats are connecting with the scout planes, or connected to the artillery, or connected to the infantry, this this has the possibility of, of of reaching a potential beyond the sum of its parts. Yes, 
I think that was realized already at the time. So they, they one one thing that was very important with the communications, yeah. a central headquarters system. And the, the problem was, and since this was a transition period, uh, would the Americans remain? Would they take charge? Or would Filipinos take charge? So there were these murky elements. It was not really, it was, we were not really sure what did the future hold. Right. And while the Americans were negotiating to retain some bases after independence, it wasn't sure really. Uh, would they re continue to retain responsibility for Philippine defense or would it really remain in our hands? So that's true. A, a very centralized command system, communication system was very, very important. And that would take time. We yeah. simply didn't have the time for that, nor did we have the money. But we were preparing officers. There was, of course, a signal corps. Uh, there was even a code unit that we were also preparing. Uh, people were studying higher command levels. Uh, there were Filipinos who were sent to the Command and General Staff College in the United States to study the higher elements of command. Uh, but they were very few. And again, it was if you have if you have a long period of time and you have a peaceful transition, you can work things out. But as we'll see, we just didn't have the time. Okay. The first the, the first trainees actually reported only in 1937. When does the war come? 1941. So you actually only have three or four trainee classes. Instead of the 400,000 that had been projected, we had only about 150,000 instead. And all the other plants, the central communication system, that was still in the drawing board. Uh, women, uh, women were also actually being considered for their own role in the defense. Not that there was a women's auxiliary corps in the Philippines at that time. There was what was called already the Women's Auxiliary Service, which was the precursor of the Women's Auxiliary Corps. But this was not really part of the army yet. This is a college student who's handling an Enfield rifle. Uh, the main thrust of the WES, or the Women's Auxiliary Service, was really basically for rear line support, medical support, uh, kitchens, uh, giving morale, and so forth. But uh, once in a while, they did handle guns like this, but they were not expected to participate in the firing line. So uh, this is uh, the symbol, or this is the, uh, this, the unit insignia of the first regular division. This was the only regular division we had uh, before the war. Everything else would be reserve divisions that could be called uh, into the service of the Philippines if and when an emergency came up. What's interesting about this is although this insignia was first designed in around 1935, 1936, the beginning of the Commonwealth, it's still in use today. This unit, the first regular division, is still an active unit in the Philippine army today. And they still proudly maintain this insignia. So by 1941, things were changing very fast. Of course, we had already heard about what had happened in Europe. We saw the collapse of Poland, and that had a very strong impact on the Philippines because Poland had a strong army. It had civilians who were willing to fight for the, defend, the defense of the country. And when Poland fell very quickly in the opening months of World War II, Quezon began to have his doubts. Is this, was this plan going to work? Look what happened to Poland. When France fell in 1940, that became even more serious. France, the major military power that it had been, was not able to stand up to the Germans. And so are we wasting our money in preparing for this military operation that might actually fail in the same way that it happened, it failed in Poland and in France? So there would be a point in time where funds would be cut, uh, this thing is not going to work, and so forth, until in the middle of 1941, when the Japanese moved into southern French Indochina, and that turned out to be the last straw for President Roosevelt at that time. That is where he would declare the oil embargo against Japan, freeze the Japanese assets, and he created the U.S. Army forces in the Far East, or the USAFR. This would now be a mixture, a conglomeration of the Philippine Army with the U.S. Army. 
different administrative structures, different pay scales, different promotion rates, and all of this. So you have two armies actually combined into this big headquarters that was called the USAFE, U.S. Army Forces in the Far East. MacArthur was naturally called to command the USAFE. And so here we have him in Camp Aguinaldo, inducting the first unit of the Philippine Army into the U.S. Army Forces in the Far East. This was the Philippine Army Air Corps, which he was particularly proud of at that time. So by this time, the Philippine Army Air Corps had been equipped with more of the biplanes that we had seen earlier, but we now also had some fighters. Here we have six P-26 fighters flying in the air. They were, of course, outmoded insofar as war was concerned at this time, but the pilots of these planes were so excited. This is better than nothing. It's the most modern thing we ever had. And so the morale was extremely high, whether they were flying these uh, biplanes or the P-26s. I knew one of the pilots and he said, we were just so excited when we got those planes. They were old. We knew they were old, but they were the most modern that we had. And we thought we are going to drive the Japanese away from the skies with these planes. So wow. very brilliant dreams. Of course, nobody knew what the, what the Mitsubishi Zero was about at that time. And so the morale was extremely high. After the Philippine Army Air Corps was inducted into the U.S. Army Forces in the Far East, other units were uh, called to the service of the United States. So they came and they had to report, they had to take the oath of allegiance to the United States. They became a part of the U.S. Army, but were not federalized. So they were simply attached to the U.S. Army, totally separate administrative structures, base scales, and all of that. So here we have uh, Filipinos who were taking the oath of allegiance. This is very early in the mobilization phase. And if we remember World War I, the mobilization in World War I and so forth, that was what was happening in the Philippines by late 1941. And uh, you have probably read that MacArthur felt that he would be ready by March of 1942. Uh, and so many uh, people were talking about, oh, we will get reinforcements from the United States, we'll train all these uh, reservists, and we'll be ready by March of 1942. Now, that date actually makes sense because the first regiments of the divisions were called in September 1, the anniversary of the start of World War II. Uh, the first regiments reported for duty for a three-month training period. So that meant they would finish their training by November. The second regiments, out of three in each division, were called in October, and that meant they would be ready by December. And the third and last infantry regiments would be called in November, nearly two weeks before the war started. They should have been ready by uh, January or February. And then put all those regiments together as a division, then they train together as a whole unit, and they'll all be ready by March. Just a by question for time, you, uh, Rick, uh, from Rick Green is saying, were there Filipinos still fighting against the U.S. at this period, i.e. guerrillas? And then, uh, yeah. and then Mindanao came up. So that's something that's still yes. happening? Yeah, that's interesting. That's an interesting question. But by this time, no, they were no longer fighting against the U.S. Uh, in Mindanao particularly, the campaign in Mindanao had ended by around 1913. And so occasionally there would be in the individual acts of uh, uh, violence. But like terrorism, no I suppose, yeah. yeah. Terrorism. So the Muslim leaders knew that they could not stand up to the Americans, so they accepted American rule from that point on. In okay, fact, what you. is interesting is that at this time, as the USAFE, as the reserve units are being called to service, a number of Muslim Filipinos were also waiting for the call. So many of them had trained under the training program, and they wanted to be called to serve as well at that time. So uh, that this there were anti-American elements still by this time, but these were more linked towards agrarian injustices. Uh, these were farmers' groups and labor unions. But okay. uh, these, these were no longer on a massive scale. Thank you. Okay, so anyway, by September, at the same time that the regiments began mobilizing, you have the Americans deciding to reinforce the Philippines. And so MacArthur would have persuaded Washington to send the most modern uh, 
aircraft, the B-17s, and uh, even the fighter units. And he felt this could serve as a form of deterrence. And even though the U.S. Navy or the Asiatic fleet was not part of the U.S. Army forces in the Far East, they had a significant submarine strength themselves. So this was a potential that uh, if the bombers and the submarines were used properly, then maybe the Japanese might have been prevented from landing. But as we'll see, the bombers were never fully used and the submarines had technical defects that they did not discover until much later on. So the B-17s were seen as a game changer. Uh, instead of going to Britain, uh, they were sent to the Philippines and large numbers were en route to the Philippines when Pearl Harbor was bombed. So tanks, even the most modern tanks, these were the M3, uh, these were the M3 tanks, the Stuart tanks. Light tanks, uh, they were brought to the Philippines, two tank battalions were brought here, and it was felt that armor could be used in Luzon. Therefore, the Japanese could be stopped in their tracks. So the combination, ideally, of infantry plus the bombers plus the submarines, this uh, could have uh, stopped the Japanese if there was enough time and if the technical issues had been resolved. But those issues were not fully re recognized at this time. And before we knew it, Pearl Harbor was hit. So this is one of the divisions that's now coming up to division strength. It is uh, to the south of Manila. You see them organized. This is just one regiment. Uh, these are part, this is part of one regiment. Uh, you will notice that they're wearing the coconut fiber helmets. Another thing that they were using was they were using short pants and they were using short sleeve shirts to save on fabric and better suited to the tropics. So here you have a machine gun team, and the machine gun teams would be very, very important in the defense of Bataan later on. So we talked about communications early, earlier on, and this was the radio set that we were trying to use then. It was very crude. It was not the most modern. And if you notice the guy in the background here, uh, they were not using a battery, but they were using no, a hand, hand crank generator. Uh, later, they would have others that were like bicycles that you pedal them. And uh, of course, this this was all right again if it worked, but they did not always work. And if they were bummed out, then that was the end of that. So we were beginning and it looked rosy. If only we had time, March 1942, we would have been ready. Unfortunately, well, aside from all this, uh, we were talking about the Philippine army in great detail prior to this, there was another unit of Philippine, Filipino soldiers, and these belonged to what were called the Philippine Scouts. This was kind of the elite unit of the U.S. Army in the Philippines. They had been trained as soldiers. They had been there since the beginning of American rule. They had been used to crush anti-American rebels earlier on. And by the 1940s, they were the most professional unit of the U.S. Army in the Philippines. Here we see a group, this is an anti-tank uh, crew. You'll see the tank, the 37 millimeter gun, anti-tank gun here covered, but you have you have the, the crew camouflaged as well. So they were extremely well-trained. Uh, they, uh, they were proud of their lineage. Some of them uh, were, you have generations serving in the Philippine Scouts. Uh, you might have a grandfather and a father and a son all serving in the Philippine Scouts because of that sense of pride in serving in this elite unit. And so you have this unit and this would be called, uh, it, would, it would be held in reserve basically, just in case the Philippine army units broke. And so they would be used to push up, to launch counterattacks and to regain the lines wherever necessary. So again, they were uh, extremely, uh, they were well-trained, they were proud, they were, extremely uh, well suited for the jobs that they would be given. Now, as the units began mobilizing in Luzon, it was recognized that there were just too many beaches that the Japanese might land in in Luzon. Uh, there are some beaches that are very classic, that have been, have, had been recognized as uh, major landing beaches, 
and some of these were uh, some troops were assigned to guard these earlier on but still even with all the units in luzon the numbers of men was not enough they needed reserves they needed uh, troops to plug in gaps and so forth and so remember that we had the 10 military districts five of them were in luzon so towards the end of 1941 it was felt that some of the units in the central philippines had to be brought to luzon to build up the ground defenses there so you had two divisions or portions of two divisions being brought from the central philippines to the luzon area some of them arrived just days before pearl harbor was struck uh, here we have a picture of some of these soldiers. This is from the central Philippine island of Negros. Uh, they are here dressed in their blue dungaree, the blue denim uniforms. For many of these Filipinos, this was the first time they would actually leave their hometown. They didn't know what they were heading to. It was the first time they would ever take a ship. So if, if one could enlarge the faces in this picture, you would probably see uh, uncertainty you would see mm. they didn't know where they were going uh, they're carrying their belongings but it's their first time away from, from their families it's their first time from their native towns and all of a sudden they would be plunked into luzon and into a war that they had they did not expect to face that soon the ship in the background that they're going to board here was the ss corregidor which was one of the biggest and fastest ships in the philippine merchant marine ship it would become very infamous later on when it struck a mine uh, shortly after the war started and sank in a matter of minutes and you had uh, for that period of time more passengers on that ship dying than those that had died in the titanic in 1912 so the loss of life was extremely severe the other thing that was se uh, se serious about the loss of this ss corridor was it was taking artillery pieces to the central Visayas and to the south. And so you will you wound up with these middle Philippines and the southern Philippines not having the artillery that they had been promised. So that would result in major problems when the Japanese landed in the south. So before anyone knew it, the, Amer the Japanese bombed Pearl Harbor. Uh, nobody, virtually nobody in the Philippines knew where Pearl Harbor was, but in a matter of hours, Clark Field was bombed, and Clark Field saw the destruction of more than half of the B-17s in the Philippines. So day one, the strategic air force is dealt with a severe blow. Yeah. The fighters are destroyed on the ground, or some of them were destroyed in the air. The illustration we see on the left here is a Japanese propaganda picture. Uh, a Japanese artist uh, painted it from the testimonies of pilots. But that was the first day. December 10, the Asiatic fleet base in Cavite was destroyed on again and totally destroyed. That meant that the Air Force was gone, the Navy was gone, the submarines would have no longer be able to base in the Philippines. And so that meant who were to defend the Philippines. I know this so, is a good point to ask you the question because it's come up in a sidebar exactly how many ground mm -hmm. defenders there were in the philippines this time because in my research for this week mm -hmm. yes the figure varies from like a few thousand or over a hundred thousand and of course mm -hmm. you're talking about some people who haven't been fully trained are they all yes. armed how mm -hmm. easy is it to kind of give down a breakdown of just the numbers we're looking at at this point there so let's say december 9th 10th 1941 yeah so if you look at that particular period december 9 or 10 i think we had about a hundred hundred thousand hundred ten thousand Right. throughout the country but that is again that counts those who were in mindanao those who are in the central philippines those who were in luzon would have numbered something like seventy thousand or so but again the levels of training were very yeah. different some had completed the three-month training program others had been in uniform for one week and so it, it was something that how do you put this mixture together and meld it into a fighting force that uh, was extremely difficult. And then you send them to the beaches to stop the Japanese from landing. So the morale was very high, but when they realized what the war was, and when the Japanese began dropping bombs, and there were no there were no planes to support them, 
and the Japanese ships shelled them and they had no sh no guns to fight the ships. And when the Japanese landed tanks, there were no tanks around. And so that meant the collapse of the front lines. Thank you. So again, there were cases of, of course, there were heroes. Uh, this is a very classic case of, uh, we remember the P-26s that we had earlier. This is uh, Major William Moore. He took his fighter squadron up into the air against modern Zero fighters. And uh, he, well, he was able to hit some planes and another, other members of his squadron were able to damage some Japanese planes as well. It's still uh, difficult to say whether he actually shot down one or two planes uh, or whether the damage was critical enough, but it was sufficient to say that these Filipinos were willing to risk their lives to fly in these antiquated planes against the most modern aircraft that the Japanese had. So the same thing would happen in different areas as well. You would have Filipinos lining up to volunteer. Uh, you would have some of them being teenagers, uh, reserve officer training corps, or OTC cadets wanting to join up into the army. Many of them would eventually have to be turned away because uh, there were not enough guns for them. Mm. And so, and Quezon himself would say, no, don't, don't get the young people. We are not going to sacrifice the young people. Send the young people back home. Send the college students back home. Now, even with that uh, move, many cadets, many of the college graduates insisted on going to the front and felt that this was something like a big game. One of the cadets who went to the front with his classmates were, wound up leaving Manila singing one of their university's basketball songs. They felt that they were going to a basketball match. And at that time also, uh, nobody thought that the Japanese were that serious a threat. It was felt that they couldn't see straight, uh, they couldn't win in China, so the war would be over in a matter of days. And they felt by Christmas Day, that would be it. We will, will be victorious. If not Christmas Day, then New Year's Day. Mm -hmm. That didn't turn out to be the case. And so as you have the uh, sudden attacks, you'd have the newspapers and the press rallying the Filipinos and expressing the anger that Filipinos had at the Japanese were attacking the Philippines. This is a uh, link between past and present. In Philippine history, one of the biggest events was the outbreak of the revolution against Spain in 1896. And the, that, that monument here symbolizes this. It still stands today. And so they said, if in 1896, that generation rose against Spain, today we will rise against the Japanese in the same way. So that was bringing past with the present. And this was the Christmas season. So again, it's kind of pathetic. It's kind of sad to see this, that you have the Christmas tree, the lights and everything, but you have the soldiers saying, in order to protect our homes, we will fight and may you have a happy Christmas. So initially it was beach defense and you have soldiers in the beaches, mortars, small artillery pieces. But again, when the Japanese dropped the bombs on them, when they landed the tanks, and when the uh, planes strafed them, then they had no weapons to deal with that. And after firing what limited rounds they had, many of them eventually had to fall back. It's also another reason for the collapse of the front lines at this time was the Japanese had landed in several other points. Uh, and the main landing area had not fully been identified. So before the main landings took place, you'd have units actually being moved to attack the Japanese in other points. And it's while these units were in the move that the main Japanese landing took place. So the Japanese landed in force. They had control of the sea. They had control of the skies. Of course, the submarines were in place. The submarines did see the Japanese coming in, but as uh, some of you might know, the, ja the American submarines at this time had defective torpedoes. That oh, the defective torpedoes, such a subject on yeah. this channel, yeah. Ricardo. I mean, it's come up numerous times. Uh, yeah, uh -huh. uh, and, and wasn't yeah. to be resolved for several years, in fact. But uh, this is, yes, a, yes. yeah. yeah. It, it took time before that. So, so the submarine captains were launching their torpedoes. Some of them would have been sure hits, but they didn't detonate. 
And so the Japanese landed. And uh, here we see the Japanese forces landing. Uh, you have, after the lines began falling back, you have the Philippine scouts sent to plug the gaps. This is a very dramatic uh, photograph of cavalry men going to the front, passing an American tank. In a few hours, some of these horses would be returning without the riders, bloodied. And uh, this would be very uh, heroic actions, but virtually suicidal at this point. So climbing over tanks to drop grenades into turrets and so forth. Very heroic action, but again, it was difficult to stem the tide. And so let's uh, skip the text here. Manila was open to Japanese attack, so it was declared an open city. The government and the headquarters of the U USAFE would evacuate Manila, transfer to Corregidor, and the Japanese would take Manila without fighting. So the defenses would take place in Bataan, and uh, this is the Bataan Peninsula that we see here. There would be two major lines. Uh, this was the first line here, which uh, was there from the whole from the beginning of January, basically to the last week of January. That was eventually broken, but there was a gap in the center that the Japanese were able to penetrate in. They also broke through the line here and established a roadblock, and the line collapsed. But not after holding for three weeks. Very heroic stand. Uh, the Japanese tried to break it, but they were unable to break it uh, for a very long time. Then it, they fell back to the second line that we see here, and uh, uh, this was a very this was a very strategic line because there was a straight, uh, undisturbed line, and in the center of it was a mountain here called Mount Samat, which overlooked the whole front. So whoever covered, controlled the mountain here, controlled essentially the campaign in Bataan. So it still is a very important mountain in terms of Philippine history today. And you have Corregidor here guarding the mouth of uh, Manila Bay. And so the whole idea of defending Bataan and Corregidor was to deny the Japanese the use of Manila Bay. They may have taken Manila, which was here, but the port facilities were totally useless. The Japanese could not use it. So as long as Corregidor and Bataan fell, this was in this could not be used by the Japanese. And Very it's coming up in the sidebar, sorry to interrupt you, Rick, it's coming up in a sidebar that the yes. Japanese weren't surprised mm -hmm. by the, the ease with which they, they, they pushed the defenders of the beaches, but they were surprised by yes. the stubbornness in the weeks that followed. You know, that 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 yes. you know, it, it kind of went perfectly to plan from the Japanese point of view mm -hmm. initially. And then as yes. so often is the case, it kind of bogged down as they went inland. Yes. So uh, the Japanese felt that it would be a pushover, actually, and uh, that that was uh, reinforced by what happened in the beaches. They were able to yeah. take the beaches very quickly. But uh, once they reached Bataan, that is where they met with their disappointment and frustration. They were unable to crack it. Uh, Singapore fell before that. Uh, Java fell before the Philippines fell. The Japanese were winning all over. And here it was Bataan that continued to stay uh, holding out against the, the Japanese. So here the Japanese really realized that trained properly, the Filipinos could fight. And again, the basic, uh, the, bu the bulk of the main lines were Filipinos. The Americans essentially were in the back. Uh, the Philippine scouts were held in reserve to plug gaps when necessary. Some Americans wound up in the front lines, of course, but uh, basically the front lines were held by Philippines. And so uh, to try to delay the Japanese, you would have bridges being mined like this. But even with the bridges destroyed, the Japanese were still able to cross with their bicycles or capturing boats to cross the rivers. So this showed the invincibility of the Japanese, at least mm. in the early days. It's when they got to Bataan, the tanks went there. It's when they got to Bataan, let's skip the, this, that they did feel and there they were stopped. And they were stopped with lines that were like this, uh, trenches, directly World War I style trenches, uh, foxholes. Uh, again, the well, this shows Americans in a trench. The front lines were really manned by Filipinos. We don't have photographs of them because Although some people were able to take pictures, they were destroyed when Bataan surrendered. 
Right. So we don't have pictures of the Filipinos in the front lines. We do have sketches, we do have artworks, and we do have uh, quite a lot of uh, descriptions of what it was like in the front line. But this was World War One style fighting. We, we prevent the Japanese, we keep a line there, a static line, and prevent them from breaking through. And ideally, wait for reinforcements to come from the United States. Of course, that did not happen. Uh, there were tank obstacles like this that were put up in the lines, and this would have stopped ideally the Japanese tanks from uh, breaking through. The jungle was another factor that uh, Bataan was chosen. Uh, jungle, the, the trees were very dense, the forests were very dense. So this is one sector of Bataan just showing how difficult it would be for anyone to fight in this area. You'll also notice the barbed wire barricades here that would block the road after the car passed. And, uh, these ideas, sorry to interrupt you again, but these ideas of roadblocks and, and blowing up bridges, was that part yes. of the original Philippines defense plan? So that if the if the beaches fall, we will have this second line of almost guerrilla warfare, or was this improvised after invasion? I think that was basically improvised. I remember a uh, one of the officers, one of the division's officers said the beach was the front line and there was no retreating from the front line. So... Uh, one reason, in fact, for the failure, one reason for uh, shortage of equipment, ammunition, and so forth in Bataan was because a lot of the ammunition was close to the beaches, and there was simply not enough time to bring them to Bataan right, right. before the Japanese came in. So, yeah, a lot of it was really uh, improvised. Uh, of course, the, the engineers had been trained to demolish bridges and all of that, but it was not part of the original plan. Okay, thank you. So anyway, to, to go into, uh, again, it's very, uh, it's very hard to visualize what was happening in the front line. Fortunately, some Filipinos were able to write about it. There was one book that they had here. I'm not sure if I can find it now. Uh, he, was a, but he was a company commander in Bataan. So he writes about it from a company commander's level. He talks about his men. He talks about his junior officers. And in particular, one incident that occurred with his uh, with, a comp with a platoon under him was in the early days of the fighting, one of his privates actually encountered a Japanese patrol and it, uh, it, it went down to hand-to-hand -hand combat. And the fellow that we see on the left, he's back to, the, to, to us, his private uh, Doria, and uh, he was holding this Japanese non-com and preventing him from uh, swinging the samurai sword. He did get nicked his ear almost fell off, but he eventually killed the Japanese. So this was how difficult it was at that time. And the Japanese knew that uh, the front line was extremely difficult to crack. So they used all sorts of things to try to uh, force the Filipinos to be confused. They dropped uh, firecrackers in the rear lines to, to make it appear that they had penetrated the line and that they were firing from the rear. But once uh, that was discovered, everybody was told, don't worry about the firing in the back, those are firecrackers. The Japanese used a lot of propaganda as well to try to persuade Filipinos to surrender. They played sentimental music and so forth, but that did not prevent Filipinos from stopping the fight. Uh, this is one of the um, Philippine division commanders at the time. Uh, the fellow on the left side here is General Vicente Lim. He was the first Filipino to graduate from West Point, uh, extremely professional, extremely uh, skilled and talented as a general. He was a division commander. His division stood up to the most ferocious Japanese attacks. And here he is in his uh, modified division headquarters, supposedly inside a pig pen. And uh, okay, well, these are proper, these are pictures taken before the war, Filipinos with a machine gun. These are from the Philippine scouts. And uh, again, the Japanese tried, they could not break the line, so they landed soldiers behind the lines. They tried to outflank it to amphibious landings. Eventually, they were wiped out in the rear. They tried to break out in the, break in the front. They were also eventually destroyed uh, once they penetrated in. And so the fighting would last until April. So these are Filipino scouts uh, with trophies that they had retrieved, the samurai sword, other Japanese weapons that they had captured. 
and so forth. The Japanese tried to use propaganda, leaflets, radio broadcasts, and so forth, saying that the, a real America, the real enemy were the Americans, uh, the Japanese were our friends, and so forth. Peace has returned to Manila, come back. And later on, as food began to run out in Bataan, then you had uh, the Japanese dropping pictures of fried chicken, menus of restaurants in Bataan, and trying to uh, whet their appetites. Uh, at one point, they even dropped pictures of sexy women, uh, half, half, half naked women, to try to entice them, surrender, and uh, don't, you, don't you miss this? You even have lips. There's one classic uh, propaganda leaflet with red, very red lips saying, I miss you so much. I, I want you to come back to me and so forth. Uh, that was something that even later on, the veterans would say that it just didn't work. It, it, it's a psychological study, actually. When you're hungry and when you're determined to fight and when you are really struggling to survive, the sexual part of it just simply mm. had no meaning. But it, but it again shows, Rico, just how how modern this war was because these are techniques that the world takes mm -hmm. for granted as part of conflict now. You know, propaganda, the guerrilla warfare aspect, the, the setting of defenses that... You know, we we tend to we tend to frame the 1941-42 period as just the Japanese mm -hmm. sweeping over everything with the Allies in various countries, Singapore being underprepared, undertrained, and just outwitted. And there's a lot of psychology going on in this. There's a lot of um, uh, there's some there are lessons in this campaign that I think are, are, are interesting from the Filipino point of view, but interesting from the study of combat point of view. And I'm uh, the people are absolutely loving it. By the way, this is one of my favorite presentations for a long time. I, I I'm absolutely enthralled by it. It's fantastic. Yeah, it, the, the use of psychological warfare is really interesting. But uh, I've talked to enough veterans who saw these leaflets and said. Uh, they just didn't make sense to us. We knew mm. that the Americans were our friends and the Japanese were not. And, and anyone who did surrender to the Japanese was tortured and killed and yeah. they found their bodies later on. So propaganda is only useful if, it, if it's, again, if it's supported by evidence. But if yeah. it's contradicted by what other soldiers are doing, then it falls flat. And so as counter-propaganda, the uh, soldiers in the front were able to come up with a, an atrocity a Filipino, young Filipino woman was discovered, uh, ravaged, and killed by the Japanese. Her name was Erlinda. So this became the slogan for Filipinos fighting. Remember Erlinda. In so doing, they would say, remember the women of the Philippines. Yeah. She might be your mother or your sister or your girlfriend or your wife or your younger sister. She was the image of the Filipino, Filipino women, the Philippines, and the Japanese were ravaging her. So this was the counter to the Japanese propaganda. And so there was also a radio station in Corregidor broadcasting. And uh, here you have American soldiers listening to it. Uh, in the beginning, it was very functional. It was very useful. But later on, when the soldiers became hungry, there were no more bullets. They began saying, you can't feed us with words. Uh, masses were held regularly near the front. Uh, most of the Filipinos were, of course, Christian. and. Okay, skip this. Uh, other heroes were not only in the front lines, but also those who were in the rear lines. So we mentioned the Philippine army soldiers. We mentioned the Philippine scouts. There were also civilians in Bataan. Uh, many of them had been uh, taken into the service. They were bus drivers. This is a Philippine bus before the war. It had been taken in. It had been uh, uh, commandeered for military service. It was brought to Bataan to bring soldiers there. And here we have it parked in front of a hospital. And you'll notice also the early model Jeep that is here. This is one of the first times that the early Jeeps actually saw combat in the Philippines and anywhere in the world. In fact. And this is what it looked like in, inside the hospital. This is when there were still beds. Uh, many of them were casualties of, of combat. They, were, uh, they had been wounded in battle and so forth. What's interesting about this is you have a nurse her back is to the camera. There have been many books written about the American nurses who served in these hospitals. But this particular nurse is a Philippine nurse. And there were more Philippine nurses in those hospitals than American nurses. And there were Filipino doctors as well. And their stories are still not fully told to this day. Uh, 
So as the campaign dragged on, the number of casualties increased and they could no longer be accommodated in the hospitals proper and they were kept outside in uh, stretchers like this. And since food was running very low at this time, you had to have alternative uh, means to get food to Bataan and Corregidor. And since the Japanese had not yet controlled Mindanao, they had not yet controlled the middle, the middle part of the Philippines, there, was, uh, there were rich sources of rice and food in the central Philippines. So ships were still around. Some of them were asked to run the Japanese blockade. This is one of those uh, blockade runners, which would come from the central Philippines all the way to Bataan and Corregidor, bringing food, bringing livestock, that itself was an act of heroism. Some of these ships were actually sunk on the way, but uh, a number of them succeeded. And of course, the everything they could bring in was uh, a very significant help to the defenders. Even the Q boats, you know, a lot has been made about the uh, American torpedo boats, and they were patrolling on the west side of Bataan. They were uh, on the offensive against Japanese ships in the west side of the Philippines. The inside part or the internal side of uh, Manila Bay was patrolled by the Philippine Army boats and two of them were able to shoot down Japanese planes even. One of them even credit, one of them even claimed to have attacked the Japanese submarine. But in the end, the Japanese received reinforcements. Uh, they had more planes. One thing that was extremely difficult for the defenders was they could not move around during daytime because the Japanese controlled the air. Uh, they ate only twice a day. They should not be able to cook during the daytime because the smoke would reveal their positions. So to save on food, the rations were cut. And by the end of the campaign, many of them were almost starving. They were very sick, they were very hungry. And when the Japanese received their reinforcements, they began bombing indiscriminately. The, one of the hospitals were, was actually hit, and one of the key doctors of the Philippines was killed. And on April 3, the Japanese launched their final offensive using a combination of aircraft, a heavy caliber guns like this. And to the Philippines, uh, April 3 was significant. This was Good Friday for the Christians. This was a sacred day. To the Japanese, it also had important historical uh, significance. This was the birthday of the first emperor that they had. And the Japanese targeted Mount Samat, which we had mentioned earlier on. It's this little hill, this little mountain here. And whoever controlled that saw what was going on in front of them. Mm. This is on the Japanese side. So this is where the most intense fighting took place. Uh, the Japanese concentrated this, they bombed it, uh, they used, uh, they, they sent their tanks here, they shelled it with the artillery pieces, and some of the soldiers running out of bullets were said that they even resorted to throwing stones or rolling rocks down the cliff and so forth just to stop the Japanese. It was, of course, a hopeless battle by this time. The Japanese had gotten veterans from Singapore and from China, and our soldiers in the front had been there since January. Uh, they were tired, they were exhausted. Many of them were sick. Uh, some of them were sick with malaria, others were sick with beriberi, uh, dysentery and so forth. But interestingly enough, many of them did not want to go to the hospitals because they did not want to leave their friends. We know that in combat and when you're in a military unit, you develop these close ties between your comrades, your, your, your company mates and your platoon. Uh, those in the same platoon, your brothers. And so that sentiment was also the same thing that Filipinos in the front line felt. And, it's, and even more so because you're defending your homeland. I mean, yes. you know, that, that exactly. bond would apply to British Tommies fighting in Alamein or, or Americans fighting in Normandy, but, but doubly, yes. triply so if you're defending your homeland and you know what's happening yes. in some of the cities, you know that what's happened already and that there's family members who've been swept up and the Japanese have been... If that doesn't create a bond of togetherness, I don't know what would. Yes, yes. So, so yeah. So some of them, I, I, I was reading accounts and I talked with some people. We didn't want to go to the rear lines. We wanted to stay in front. We were, we were fighting for something. But in the end, of course, with that concentrated artillery, aerial bombardment, the lines would have to fall. 
So again, this is Mount Samat at that time uh, from a Japanese uh, perspective. Today, this is Mount Samat today. So this becomes the center of all national ceremonies to commemorate uh, the fall of Bataan. We now call it the Day of Courage. And where the stiffest fighting was in 1942, you now have this uh, chapel and you have this cross that marks the sacrifices of the defenders of Bataan. And so the end came. It was April 9, 1942, the American commander of Bataan was forced to surrender. And after that, let's skip this, even General Lim, who we had seen earlier in the pig pen, that's him here surrendering to the Japanese. And the Japanese knew they captured someone very important here, so they took his picture. And after that uh, occurred the surrendering. These are Filipino. We have a lot of uh, pictures in the web of Americans surrendering. Of course, many of them were post pictures. The Japanese made them post. But there were also these pictures showing Filipinos coming from the front line, coming from the mountains. This is a Japanese tank on the right side. And others trying to push this bus so it would start. So uh, this would show that there were more Filipinos in the, the campaign. So I might have taken up too much time. So I, let me cut this short. Then let me. Uh, uh, a friend of mine will talk about Corregidor. So let me leave that campaign to him later on. But with the surrender in Bataan would occur the death march. This is what it looks like today, where the one of the one of the uh, wings of the march started. And uh, you have what is called the zero kilometer. You have every kilometer marked along the way, all the way to prison camp. And uh, these are again, this picture shows these are all Filipino soldiers who are uh, at the mercy of this Japanese guard. Uh, the, the death march was a nightmare, but the local people in the towns that they passed provided food and assistance, whatever they could. Uh, they were loaded up into boxcars in one major town, uh, taken to the uh, prison camp where they had to march the last uh, kilometers to the prison camp. But where they stopped, and if the doors were open, the townspeople here, feeling a sense of camaraderie, sympathy, would throw in food and uh, whatever they could to help these uh, now prisoners of war. Mm. And uh, this is a memorial that was made in 1942 to those who died uh, due to starvation, uh, lack of medicine. You have more Filipinos dying in the prison camp than who died in the actual Bataan campaign. The memorial that was unveiled in 1942 still stands today, but it's slightly modified with a new uh, caption in front of it. And in 1946, when one visited the camp, this showed just how many people had died in the camp. Many of them were never fully identified and so uh, the toll that we have here is something that still felt very strongly by the families concerned. Hmm. So I guess at this point, let me, well, let me skip to the last slide. There are some others I was going to talk about the Corregidor. Well, you're going to get an invite again. There's no question about it. If, if I don't invite you back, I think the viewers yeah. of World War II TV will string me up. They're, 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 they're loving this. So I think we'll just, we'll bring you back again. But yeah, we will. But I'll let you skip to the last slide. And... Yeah, let me slip, uh, skip to the last slide then. Okay, well, there would be a guerrilla resistance movement, of course. And uh, I picked this picture because these, these were not only active in the guerrilla resistance movement. These were indigenous peoples yeah. who also felt the same, I, the same sentiment with uh, people from the towns and the cities. They fought with their bows and arrows and their blow guns. And some of them were in Bataan as well. And I think... One of uh, our speakers uh, will probably talk a little bit about that. And of course, this was the hardship under the Japanese. So this was what they were fighting for. They knew this was what was going to happen. And so this was what they were fighting against. And I think that while, if you put it back on that one about the hardship there, because I yeah. think that is where I want to kind of bring things to an end. And yes, we will bring you back again, because from my Western point of view, it seems that often the Filipino experience in World War II is framed from the point of view as you as the victims. Mm 
Mm-hmm. You know, the U.S. are winning the war. The U.S. are having to carry our battles out to sea and things like that. And the and the Philippines is more about about victim. We had James M. Scott on last year talking about you know yeah. rampage in Manila and and yes. that tragedy that happened there in 1945, which is of course a compelling, important story to tell. Um, yes. But I think the story of of the defense in 41, 42 is not talked enough outside of of your country. I think. The fact that that you know you are the Philippines are resisting that there's this 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 army there. I think this is the aspect that I think a lot of people watching this, like myself, are, have learned from this. In that it's not that the Western historians have got it wrong; it's just that Western historians have been writing about it from the Western point of view. I mean, we think of the Rick Atkinson trilogy of books where it is about the USA's experience in World War II. So everything is framed from the US point of view. Even the North Africa and Mediterranean campaign is, is is from that point of view. But it's been really really in Lightning to hear this from your uh, from your point of view, um, and and I think to hear about the Philippines and the Filipinos is not just being victims, but of being influencing and steering your own history. I think has been fantastic. Yes, yeah. So th- this is a subject of another lecture. In fact, this is one whole class. Uh, I have a graduate class just on this. But yeah, let me well, see. last sorry. slide then, and uh, yeah. So we talked about the guerrilla resistance movement, but. Uh, of course, the cost, uh, General Lim did not survive the war. He joined the guerrillas, was captured, and was executed. And he is remembered in our 1,000 peso bill. So here we have General Lim, who fought in Bataan. Uh, the other two characters, the other two uh, persons that we see here, uh, Jose, Jose Abad Santos, representing the government, executed by the Japanese as well. Uh, Jose Falianes Escoda, who represented women, civil society, also executed by the Japanese then. So let me end this uh, presentation for uh, this evening or this afternoon or wherever you are. And thank you for listening. Well, it's been absolutely fantastic. And yeah, the, 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 the fact there haven't been many questions is indicative of the fact you've actually been explaining everything as we're going along. And people are just sitting there going, yep, learning, learning, learning. The, I can always tell when they're just sitting back going, yeah, yeah, taking it. Sometimes the conversations go to their favorite aircraft or what they're having for dinner today. It's just been, this is great. This is great. Learning, learning, learning. So we will bring you back again in the future. But, you know, I think I want to echo again this idea that the importance of, of everybody watching is to not just read your history from those of the country you are growing up in. So if you're British, yes, it's great to read Brit- our favorite British historians. If you're American, likewise. But it's so important to get the points of view of people around the world. And and it's been talked. So half of the people watching are your classmates. There's uh, there's Noel is watching, but you're also especially in the Japanese aspect as well. And I think that's the point of view we're still yet to really mm-hmm. understand. We've talked about midway from the Japanese point of view, but really. We don't we don't talk about these events from the Japanese point of view. So that's something again we should be doing. I'm hoping that as we move forward, an archives become digitalized and things like that. And there's the Google Translate that more English speaking historians will get access to Japanese archives. So so to end this, my last question to you on this presentation is 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 where do you think the study of the Philippines needs to go from Western eyes? You know, you, you're doing fantastic work there within the Philippines, but are there is there somewhere, what do we need to do outside of the Philippines to understand the conflict? Yeah, well, of course, I think an understanding that World War II was not just a European war, but it was a world war. And so that it has to be studied from all angles. You did mention the Japanese side. I did study in Japan. I met a number of uh, people who actually served in Bataan. I, I listened to them talk. I bought their books and uh, that is one thing that we still don't uh, fully know and what i've discovered in this uh, this whole endeavor of uh, doing research interviewing people was that the deeper you get into it the more you understand that we shouldn't have been at war that we know uh, today we're all friends I, I could speak to american veterans and filipino veterans and japanese veterans even australian veterans who served here and canadians as well uh they were all friends so they said what happened why did that war take place so there are lessons to be learned and they are not just lessons limited to the philippines i think in propaganda war for example or in strategy and tactics you do have lessons that we still 
can apply to the present day. And I think this is where uh, I know we did try it with some Japanese friends. We had a kind of collaborative effort with some Japanese friends. We tried to come up with a joint research project. We used Japanese materials, Philippine materials, American materials. It's that kind of thing that I think is very important. We did have that project in the 1990s, published a few uh, articles and books out of that. But uh, that is one thing that has to be done, and that has to continue. Yeah, well, that's fantastic sentiment to end it with. So um, there's no getting away from it. You're going to get invited back. Our next Philippines week is in October, but I, I'm thinking of a million things I can have you back to talk about. And it's been a fantastic start to, to this series. And folks, if you're going to be with us later in seven hours time or something, John McManus is joining us to give that American point of view of how the Americans saw the Philippines in the 1930s, 1940 and 41. And that will be kind of a sprawling conversation between, between John and I. And then we carry on this week with more presentations from so it's four guests are from the Philippines and two are not from the Philippines. But that is a subject this week. So, Rico, it's been fantastic talking to you. Thanks for everybody who's got up at stupid times of day to watch this or have been skiving off work to watch this. We appreciate you here on World War II TV. This is Paul Woodard for the channel saying I'll see you all again in six and a half hours, something like that, for the joint manners. Thank you, Ricardo. Thank you, viewers. Cheers, everybody. Bye. Thank you. Thank you. Bye.